Greater than all we see, greater than all we ask. He has done great things, lifted up. He defeated the grave, raised to life. Our God is able in His name. We overcome for the Lord. Our God is able. God is with us. God is on our side. He will make a way Far above all we know Far above all we hope He has done great things Lifted up He defeated the grave Raised to life Our God is able In His name we overcome for the Lord, our God is able. Dieu est puissant, Dieu est puissant, il est juste et grand. Il peut tout accomplir Plus grand que nos pensées Plus grand que nos désirs Il a fait de grandes choses Élevé Il a vaincu la mort Oui, il vit Mon Dieu est puissant En son nom j'ai la victoire, le Seigneur, mon Dieu est puissant, élevé, élevé, il a vaincu la mort, oui il vit, mon Dieu est puissant, en son nom, j'ai la victoire, le Seigneur, mon Dieu est puissant. God is with us. God is with us. He will go before. He will never leave us. He will never leave us. God is for us. He has open arms. He will never fail us. He will never fail us. God is with us. God is with us. He will go before. He will never leave us. He will never leave us. God is for us. He has open arms. He will never fail us. He will never fail. Lift it up. Lift it up. He defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in His name, He overcomes, for the Lord, our God is able, lift it up, lift it up, He defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able, in His name we overcome, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able, for the Lord our God is able. Hello, everyone. To the, welcome, everyone, to this workshop with Cardinal Tagli. We're so happy to welcome him. 
can you please come forward? Come to the first parts of the of the room. And if you're going to another worship, please go ahead and go to the place where your workshop is going to start. We're going to start soon. It's going to be in English this morning. For the translations, are the translatings, translations working? So English speakers, y'all can hear me? Great. Thanks for letting me know. Happy to have you here as usual. Obviously, I'm not going to be translating much this morning. Woohoo! Um, but it's, it, this workshop is going to take place um, with a time of, of speaking from uh, Cardinal Tagli and then question and answer session. So once again, we're going to put up the frequencies for the translations. All right. So I don't speak English very well, but I will speak English for our eminence. So we are very pleased to welcome you here. Did you arrive this morning? Yesterday afternoon. Okay. I, I just wanted to ask you one question, first of all. How many times did you uh, participate to GMG? Three times. Three times. Three times already, yes, sir. And the last one? Sydney. Sydney. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Some Australian guys over there. Maybe. All right, so you were born in uh, 1957 in Manila. You became priest in February 1982. Yes. And in December 2001, uh, you were ordained bishop of um, Ismus Joses. Okay. And 10 years later, <laughs> you first became Archbishop of Manila, and one year later, in uh, 2012, you were created Cardinal by Benedictus XVI. Okay. And <laughs> so today, Eminence, you are a member of many pontifical councils. Um, the councils for the family, the council for the pastoral care of migrants and itinerant people. You're also part of council for Cons uh, Consecrated Lives Institute and uh, also for evangelization all over the world. Okay. And you were part of the conclave that elected our Pope Francis, yeah, in 2013. And I think you, all of you know that Pope Francis just published his new apostolical exhortation called The Joy of Love. And uh, in this book, I don't know if you read it, but the Pope talks a lot a lot, a lot about love into family and how to to build to to build a, a family that is strong, that is lovely, and you will talk about us a little bit about how to start a family, how to put things well in order for a strong um, construction of family. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, greetings from the Philippines. Please say Mabuhay. Mabuhay. Ah, okay, thank you, thank you. I bring you warm greetings from the Philippines, especially from the Archdiocese of Manila. <laughs> greetings to everyone. Okay. 
uh, since this is uh, an event that's uh, organized by uh, Shemanov, j'apporte uh, uh, des félicitations des Philippines. Wow! I bring the congratulations Salute. from the Philippines. <laughs> Saluti cari delle Filippine. Right. And we want to thank Antonin who uh, uh, gave a wonderful introduction. Now, the topic of my workshop is starting a family. Maybe I should not be the one <laughs> qualified to give this uh, workshop, no? But we will try with the help of especially the Synod of Bishops and the uh, exhortation of Pope Francis. How many of you want to start a family? Raise your hands. Oh, all of you. Wow. Yeah, good, good, good. We need that. We need people who will be committed to building and starting families. Uh, that's enough. Uh, put your hands down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In spite of the many uh, challenges and even threats to family life, we continue to affirm the beauty of the family. No problem, no challenge, no threat could diminish the beauty of the family. The family is still good news. And we, Christians, Catholics, should be the first to proclaim that the family is truly good news. This is part of the Word of God. This is part of the teachings of the church. This is part of the testimony of many valiant men and women who lived through families. We have saints among mothers and fathers. We even have couples who have been beatified, canonized, and their children have also been declared saints. And it is good news that some non-Christians, non-Christians share with us the belief that the family is important and that the family is a gift of God to society. Your own parents, I know, are trying their best. In spite of difficulties and uh, hardships, they don't give up on each other. They don't give up on you. They don't give up on the family. They believe it is worth their while to continuously offer themselves to the family. Yet we know that there are some big, big concerns that we have to face. And these concerns make some people abandon the idea of marriage and family. Unfortunately, some people still believe in family, but they postpone starting a family. They wait until they are 80 years old to start a family, you know, yeah. Or some just don't put in responsible preparation for beginning a family. During the Synod of Bishops, there were some 
issues or concerns that were raised, why do some people abandon the idea of family? Why don't they want to start a family? Or why are they postponing family life? Maybe later on we could interact on that. But just to share with you, one big concern is financial. They say, I am not economically, financially stable yet. I cannot even sustain my own life. I am not ready to start a family. Some people postpone weddings, their marriage, because of the cost of a wedding. They have to spend much for their uh, wedding attire, their gowns, their uh, suits. They have to save money for the banquet, the dinner, the reception. They have to save money for the video, for the photographs, you know? And they say, oh, if I don't have enough money for that, then what type of wedding will happen? And now they, they want weddings and tourism to come together. So I am from the Philippines. I will get married in the Caribbean destination wedding. But you need money to save. You need to save money for that. And so while saving money, I postpone, I postpone, I postpone my wedding. Others have to face emotional, psychological, concerns, the level of maturity, the level of maturity that we need for a commitment to marriage and to family life. I don't know what's happening in different parts of the world, but there was a psychologist in the Philippines who said that nowadays, oh, hey, Filipinos, listen. <laughs> nowadays, a regular Filipino gets out or graduates from adolescence at the age of 35. Huh? So at the age of 34, a regular Filipino still thinks and acts like a teenager. Just like me. <laughs> Immature. <laughs> when, I, when I share this, when I share this with an Italian bishop, the Italian bishop told me, where? You are lucky because here in Italy, they become adults at the age of 41. Oh, I said, wow. So we are extending and extending adolescence. So when will we make a commitment? Emotionally, psychologically, and relationally mature to start a commitment. For us, maybe we need to address the need for a deeper, biblical, scriptural, and faith formation regarding the beauty of marriage and family. Because even among Catholics, marriage is becoming a social and cultural event and less of a faith sacramental event. And finally, we also realize that there are some 
ideologies, thought patterns that do not always agree with the teachings of the church regarding marriage. So these are some of the concerns that were surfaced during the Synod of Bishops and affirmed by Pope Francis. Marriage is beautiful. It is good news. Many people believe in marriage. Many young people still believe in marriage. And I should tell Pope Francis, when we see him next week, in Woods, I asked the youth how many want to start a family and practically all of them raised their hands. This will be good news, you know, good news. Young people still believe. Let me try again. How many want to start a family? Oh, very good. Oh, even the priests there are raising their hands. Huh? <laughs> oh, like that, they're saying that, yes, oh, peace, <laughs> yeah, okay, starting a family, I have only one, only one major point, and then later on, I would like to uh, give a few proposals. The only point is this, starting a family, which is your, your desire or the desire of many young people, is both a grace or God's gift to us and also our human responsibility. Starting a family requires openness, to God's gift. We cannot start a family only by our own desire, plan, or design. In the same way that for priests, for religious, for consecrated lay people, the grace of God comes first. And then the response follows. So those of you who raised your hands a while ago, you want to start a family. But the first question is, does God want you to start a family? And then you cry, <laughs> I want it, but maybe God has another gift for you. But starting a family is God's gift. It is God's beautiful gift. You know, after the World Youth Day, I will go home right away to the Philippines because in August, my parents will celebrate their 60 years of married life, 60th anniversary. And if you ask my parents, if you ask my brother and myself, we have only one answer. It must be God's grace. We know our father, we know our mother, we know ourselves. Without God's gift, this family would not have happened. For love is God's gift. God allows us to participate in the inner life, the inner divine life of Father, Son, and Spirit. That's how a family starts, the gift of God's love. So to God be the glory. God, who is Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, shares with us 
the love that enables different individuals to become one family. So we start a family by opening ourselves to God's grace and calling. But as I already indicated, it starts with God's grace, but we need to accept that grace. Every gift must be received, must be received with recognition and with responsibility. This is what we call intentionality. I intend to cooperate with God's gift. God may give us the gift to start a beautiful family, but do I accept it and intend mean to pursue that gift, to make it grow, to develop it, and to see it to its fulfillment. In 1 Corinthians 13, St. Paul gives us the highest spiritual gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and for him, it is the highest, the superior gift. And what is it? Love. You may have other gifts. You may have the gift of speech, but without love, you are just making noise. Just like me. <laughs> Maybe I'm just making noise. If I am speaking without love, then I'm just making noise. I'm just like a clanging cymbal. The greatest of God's gift in the Holy Spirit is love. It is given to us to start a family. But there are no easy recipes for starting a family of love. I cannot give you, your bishops cannot give you, your own parents cannot give you a recipe so that you can start a family that is fully packaged as a good, holy family. No. We just trust that God's spirit of love will be given to us. But you need to intend, if I may paraphrase what St. Paul says, the gift is given, but we need to intend to be patient and kind. You have to make a decision to be patient and kind. You have to decide to serve. You must decide to understand the other person. You must decide to be respectful. You must decide to be generous. You must decide to forgive. You must decide to believe, to hope, and to bear all things. That's the gift. But you have to accept it. And you have to mean it to mean it. We start a family because God starts it. And you start the process with God. Not just with your partner, but with God, you together starting with God. But you will realize starting <laughs> will happen every day. Starting a family is a daily, a daily concern. 
Starting a family means starting to start it over and over again. There is no end to starting. When you start, it is just the beginning of many other starting a family. So you do not say, oh, finally, I have started a family. No, tomorrow you start it again. Maybe this afternoon, maybe this evening, or maybe after a few minutes. Huh? I had an experience. I officiated in a wedding of a couple at 9 o'clock in the morning. By 6 o'clock in the evening, they came back to me. We decided to separate <laughs> the same day. Huh? So they have to start again. Start. You start to start over and over again. You always start with acquaintanceship. You get to know the person. You get to, you married someone at the age of 25. By the time both of you are 55, you need to get to know each other again. When you met her, when she was 18, she smelled of a, wow, rose perfume. Now she is 65. She smells of menthol painkiller. So you need to get to know her again. You start living with a woman who does not smell of rose perfume anymore, but of, uh, yeah. You married a man with a shock of black hair. By the time he was 40, no more hair. So you start again. If you are a wife with long hair, keep your long hair and then cut it. Bring it to a shop so that the shop could make it into a wig for your husband <laughs> to pay. <laughs> you start over again. You start again. You get to know each other. And then you become friends again. The engagement happens over and over again. And then after the first years, you need to start learning again. With the coming of the first children, you learn again. The children start going to school. You start again. Some things have to go. You cannot go on expensive uh, vacations anymore. You have to start. Crises come. You start again. Then grandchildren come. You start again. How to become a grandparent. Sickness comes. Alzheimer's comes. Your husband approaches you and asks you, who are you, lady? You start again. Death comes, you start again. All of this with God's grace. We need to trust in God's grace, enabling us to love, but we need to accept it and never get tired, never get tired. Before I go to the last portion, how many more minutes do I have? Oh, 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, it is not just difficulties or fights that call for a new start. As I described it, based on Amoris Letizia, every stage of life of the family is a new beginning, a new start. So do not give up on each other. Do not give up because God will not give up on us. So let us not give up on each other. I remember in the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, I was asked to give a, a conference, a sharing on the family, the place where wounded hearts are healed. And you start again with wounded hearts. And I, I shared with them a, a song that was uh, composed, I think it was uh, composed by Bert Bacharach. And uh, I, for me, it's still one of the best songs regarding starting again and again. You know, the, I'm sorry, the translators would have to translate in different languages. So I don't know how they will do it. But uh, yeah, in English, it's still, it still retains its, its beauty. You know? uh, the song says, a chair is still a chair even when there's no one sitting there. But a chair is not a house, and the house is not a home when there's no one there to hold you tight and no one there you can kiss good night. A room is still a room even when there's nothing there but gloom. But a room is not a house, and the house is not a home when the two of us are far apart and one of us has a broken heart. Now and then, I call your name. Suddenly, your face appears, but it's just a crazy game. When it ends, it ends in tears. Then the beautiful part, darling, have a heart. Don't let one mistake keep us apart. I'm not meant to live alone, turn this house into a home. When I climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please be there, still in love with me. Wow. Huh? Let us start. Don't let one mistake keep us apart. When I climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please be there, still in love with me. That should happen on the first day, and that should happen until death, a never-ending starting of family. Let me close by suggesting a few things. Please, in the Synod and Amoris Letizia, we are told that some young people have many fears about starting a family. We already mentioned the financial fears. Don't worry. Make your wedding simple. And if it is a simple wedding, then you don't have to worry about expenses. That's the solution. Make it simple. You postpone the wedding because I don't have a gown yet. Then don't use a gown. Use a simple dress. I don't have a suit yet. Well, I can lend this to you. Make sure you return it to me after your wedding. 
I was talking with my father last week, and he told me, and this is the first time I learned it, he said, you know, when we got married, I borrowed a pair of shoes from a friend. He did not even have money to buy a new pair of shoes for his wedding. He borrowed, and now it's 60 years. You may use, you may buy the most expensive shoes, but that's not a guarantee that you will start over and over again. You might use the shoes to run away. <laughs> so don't worry about those financial concerns. Be simple. Also, don't be afraid of failure. There is no such a thing as a perfect relationship. Crisis will come. Expect that. But it is not the crisis, but it is your intention to love in the crisis. How did God prepare for the family of Jesus? We learn in the first chapter of St. Matthew, verses 1 to 17, you have the genealogy of Jesus, the ancestors of Jesus, kings, patriarchs, kings, and also unknown. The ancestors of Jesus were saints and sinners, a mixture, and God can embrace sinners. We, should be able to embrace the imperfections that we find in our own families. That's why Jesus was very close to sinners. He had in his DNA, the DNA of great patriarchs and kings, but also DNAs of prostitutes, liars, corrupt people. But he did not give up on them. Joseph. Joseph and Mary were already engaged, but a crisis came. Mary was found with child by the Holy Spirit, and apparently she did not tell Joseph Joseph just learned about it. And so Joseph wanted to separate from Mary. But Joseph obeyed the angel. Mary obeyed the angel. It is by obedience to God that the family of Jesus was constituted. A family that started with trust in God's gift. Even when the gift looks absurd. Even when the gift looks weird. They accepted the gift. Then many threats to the family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Herod wanting to kill the baby. And they became a refugee in Egypt. Then the child Jesus went to Jerusalem with the parents at the age of 12, and the child got lost. That was the version of the World Youth Day in Jerusalem. And the child Jesus got lost. <laughs> One crisis. But they did not give up. They did not say, okay, he's 12 years old. Let him come home. They looked for him. They started again. Then, Jesus started his ministry. He was rejected in Nazareth. Why? Because of his family. He is the son of a carpenter. He is the son of Mary. We know them. Why does he behave this way? Some people said, Jesus, 
was under the spell of the prince of demons, Beelzebul. And you know, his own relatives thought he was crazy. Jesus was arrested. His friends left him. But who stood at the foot of the cross of Jesus? Peter denied him. I do not know him. Judas sold him. Nobody wanted to be associated with Jesus. But Mary, at the foot of the cross of Jesus, was declaring, she is my son. I am his mother. I will not leave him. Even when others have abandoned him, I will be here. I am his mother. And a new family is born. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? Those who do the will of the Father is brother, sister, mother to me. Even in the face of trials, God does not give up on families. God will send love, the Spirit, but we need to accept it. Let us start rebuilding our nuclear family, but let us also start building again and again the family of God. This is a beautiful encounter. People, young people from different countries, speaking different tongues, eating different types of food. <laughs> you with different experiences. You are one family. Why? Because of the love of God. And we are all striving to follow the will of God. That's how to start a family. Believing in the will of God, the way Mary, Joseph, and Jesus did. A family that began with the will of God and intended by human beings. A family threatened, but constantly starting, starting, even in the face of the greatest trials. Starting a family. Learn now not to give up on persons. Not to give up on anyone. Starting a family means learning how to start without end. The moment you end your capacity to start, you are not capable of starting a family. Let me close this with a story. You know, there are many displaced people right now, refugees, most especially refugees. I visited a refugee camp in Greece on the border with Macedonia. And there I saw people running away from violence and war. They had nothing, only the clothes that they have on their bodies and the most precious to them, their families. They bring only what is precious, their families. Unfortunately, some of them have witnessed the death of family members 
as they escape from war. You have children, most especially children, who are now traveling without parents. I was able to interview the woman in charge of the distribution of food and humanitarian help to the refugees. She was the vice mayor of the village. I asked her, is this part of your job as vice mayor? She said, no, this is volunteer work for me. I said, hmm, why? Don't you have enough things to do as vice mayor? You added <laughs> onto yourself uh, more responsibilities as a volunteer. Then she said, young people, listen to this. She said, my ancestors were refugees. I have refugee DNA in my body. They are my brothers and sisters. I will never abandon them. They are family. Even in a, in a camp for refugees, we are asked by the Lord, start a family. Start a family there of mercy, of compassion. Embrace them. Do the will of the Father. Make them experience the love that the Holy Spirit wants for the whole world. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence, for everything that you have shared with us, which gives us hope, which is encouraging to all of the young people who are here today to start a family. We're going to have a time of question and answers. We have about 25 to 30 minutes. So we can, we're going to take three, two or three questions at a time, and we can ask these questions in different languages, and those will be then translated. We can simply raise our hands um, to then ask our question. It could be questions um, regarding what uh, you've heard now or questions that you have in general about family. Thank you very much for your intervention. I'm French, but I try to formulate it in English. You spoke that one of the concerns of young people about starting a, a family are psychological or emotional concerns. And so my question is, uh, as young people, when we, we know that we have wounds, that we have brokenness, uh, that are not reconciled yet, um, that we don't feel mature enough, but that we have this will to start a family, what would you say? <laughs> Thank you very much. Autre question? Another question? On commence avec celle-là, alors. Your Excellence, thank you for sharing your gifts and your, your knowledge and your wisdom. Uh, my question is, um, what are the threats 
or you, if you could expand on the threats that are facing families nowadays, the common ones that we think that they're not threats, but they're actually threats. Thank you. Encore une autre question ou pas? Another question? So we'll. Ah, here. Um, for you, what would be the role uh, we can play as a child in the, the love of a couple, of our parents? Um, good morning, Your Excellency, and uh, oh. thanks for coming. Um, firstly, NFP, natural family planning, gets me really excited because it seems like a beautiful way of working with God's plan and being uh, reasonable um, with what we can do with our family and how quickly we can expand. But uh, I was wondering, is there a point where NFP, natural family planning, can be used like a contraceptive? Um, and my second question is, can I get a photo with you after this? Thanks. <laughs> that's that's the easiest question to ask and to answer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so we'll we'll answer these uh, four questions first. Yeah. Thanks to the uh, the 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 the. the <clears throat> Uh, to the persons who raised the questions. They're important, but given the time uh, constraint, I will not be able to give a full-blown or comprehensive answer. So the first is, uh, basically the question is, okay, we young people know we have needs, our brokenness, our wounds, emotional, psychological, relational, and even non not reconciled yet. I am not yet reconciled with all of those. But then I already desire to start a family. And you're asking, maybe the, if I could rephrase the question, will there be a time when I could say, I am prepared to start a family? Okay. You know, technically speaking, we will never, never be prepared for anything if we expect ourselves to be 100% clean, pure, reconciled, healthy, you know, maybe even in heaven, we will be still the wounded persons that we are right now. No? Remember, the risen Lord appeared to the disciples with wounds. The wounds did not disappear in the risen Lord. So we will always have our wounds. Now, you have to distinguish some wounds if not handled well. Huh? If not handled well, could impair my capacity for a lifetime commitment. It does not mean it is hopeless, no. But if I see with humility and honesty that my wound is so deep, maybe I should first ask for help. Help from a counselor, help from a spiritual director, so that I could know how to handle the wound in a decent manner. No, but to wait for a time when the wounds disappear, I don't think that will come. You know, so uh, with the help of other people and with your own honesty, with your humility and your uh, openness to healing, then I guess uh, it could be safe. But it is not also the goal only of, the, of one person. When you start a family, then the members of the family should help 
each other in the healing of wounds, in the reconciliation of every member of the family to his or her own wounds. So nobody does it alone. The members of the family must help each other. Hey, now, uh, thank you. <laughs> now, some of the, the threats to the family, and most especially threats that are not revealed as threats. Uh, wow, this will require a real knowledge of the trends in society. You know, young people, I beg you, please help your pastors, help your teachers, help your bishops to understand your situation and the threats hidden in the day-to-day -day, uh, experiences of the young people because we grew up in another world and so we cannot claim to fully understand the world that you are living in. Uh, when I was a young boy, we had no television. We had our t television, I think I was already nine years old. When did I get hold of a computer for the first time? When I was 29 years old. You young people were already born with a computer in your mouth. Uh -huh. <laughs> You, you already, your babysitters are televisions. Now, what is the effect of that on the human mind and everything? So I, I am beginning to, uh, to answer this question by asking you, help us understand this world. Because we see the positive things. We see the beauty of social communications. We see the beauty of technology. But unless we hear from you, how does it also affect your understanding of the human person, human relationships, the songs that you sing? For example, there is a song that became famous in the Philippines years ago in Filipino. In English, the title is, I wish I had two hearts because I love both of you. So I wish I had two hearts, one for her, one for her, and that will solve the problem. But the gospel says, blessed is the single-hearted. <laughs> but then you sing, sana dalawa ang puso ko. Ano, I hope, I wish I had two hearts. But if you keep singing that, you develop a mentality where, well, next time I wish I had three hearts. I wish I had four hearts. I wish I had five hearts. What are the songs that you sing? What are the songs that you do do da do do cha cha do do da 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 da? I mean, I mean, I mean, are they? What does that give you? When you see somebody, you say, <laughs> I attended a youth mass, and the opening song was, Ahum, Ahum, Ahum. I said, what is, what is that, Ahum? You know? I was tempted, tempted to say, Ahum, 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 Ahum. Oh, what is that? You know? What do you feed your minds? What, the, what do the love songs tell you? Family meals. When I was growing up, no meals started unless all the members of the family were there. That's why we had to come home because everyone would get hungry. 
Nobody will eat without you. Now, you get your food, your plate, you go before the television. Your sister or brother gets his or her plate, and he or she goes before the computer. When do families interact? Father Peyton says, a family that prays together stays together. I say, a family that eats together stays together. So I have no, uh, it's, it's just, no? try to discern. These are hidden, but they are becoming normal. They are becoming normal. The third question is, aha, the role of children in the holiness of your parents. My dear, thank you for raising that question. We expect parents to guide the children in holiness, in human mature maturity, etc. And rightly so, we adults must guide you based on our knowledge and also our experience, not only our good experience, even our <laughs> failures could teach us how to guide the young. But now I realize you young people could challenge us. You know, I speak before you as someone much older than you are. When you are at a certain age, it is difficult to change some habits. So we just do things over and over again. You young people, you have new ideas, you have idealism, please challenge us. For example, your parents do not go to church. Maybe you could uh, invite them, or maybe you can even say, Daddy, Mommy, I will sing in the choir for this Mass. Would it not be lovely if you were there to see me? Little things like that. In the Philippines, we started a, a few years ago in the Archdiocese of Manila, an anti-corruption, anti-corruption uh, campaign. We told people, especially the young, to wear t-shirts. And on the front, it is said, do not steal. That's a commandment of the Lord. So if you cannot say it with words, let your t-shirt say it. <laughs> huh? So you say to your dad, hi, dad, and let your dad see it. Do not steal. <clears throat> you young people can do a lot. Share with us your idealism. Share with us your joy. Sh show to us that following Jesus is worth it. No? But contaminate us. Go viral. No, go viral. The virus of good influence. And not only with your fellow young people, but even with the elders and the, uh, your parents to begin with. You do it, huh? You do it. And finally, uh, the question about natural family planning. And the question is, is it possible or could it be possible that the natural family planning uh, approach could, could be used like uh, a form of contraception? This is not new as a question and as a concern. In fact, some moral theologians and even uh, promoters of the natural family planning have been warning us that the natural family approach could be used with a contraceptive mentality. So instead of generosity, 
instead of a sense of responsibility, the NFP could be used in order to be stingy. Again, it is an appeal. It is, uh, uh, we hope it is not judgmental for God sees the mind and the heart. But it is a valuable warning. The means could be natural, but the mentality could be contraceptive. So the advice is to find consistency, consistency of the mind, the heart, and the practice. So we can take a few more questions, two or three more questions. You can ask them in your own languages. We still have five to 10 minutes. Um, I'd like to hear your opinion about broken families. Maybe if you could focus more on the role of the church on broken families. Um, thank you. Uh, also, I have, I have a question here. Uh, he asks about uh, in, uh, in the case of a death of a partner, back here in the back. And in case of a death of a partner, what happens? Uh, 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 could you please repeat the question? How should I live in the future? How, in the death of a, in the death of a partner, how he should live in the future? How we should live in the future? Yes. Mm. Wow. <laughs> um, you said that we have. When we start a family, we have to start again every day, every year, at every stages of life. Um, how do we do? Like, is it just praying together, talking? But how do we do, like, concrete stuff to do? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, first, regarding broken families. Uh, you know, there is a move to change the terminology because in some sense, every family has wounds and brokenness. Uh, in fact, nowadays, they want to talk about families in special difficult situations, uh, difficulties. Now, according to the Synod of Bishops and the uh, Amoris Letizia, the role of all of us, the church, is first to be a community where the wounded, where the members of families with difficulties would experience welcome, understanding, and mercy. Because they are already suffering. They are already in pain. And so, Hopefully, our parishes, our dioceses, our religious movements and organizations could give them an experience of welcome and mercy. The other thing is for the church to try to see how these communities who, are, who feel alienated, who feel far, from the church. In fact, they are ashamed, embarrassed to come to the Lord. Our role is how to integrate them into the Christian community so that they will not feel alienated. So the little things that could be done in their prayer life, in their integration into the community, we hope could be extended to them. So not to be judgmental, uh, condemning right away, okay? Now, the second is how to live in the future. You know, there are two things that I want to, uh, to uh, say regarding this. For us Christians, the future is already assured. And what is that? The future is to be with God. Jesus rose from the dead. And 
we know where we are headed towards. As we already said uh, in, the, in, in Christianity for thousands of years, Jesus has already opened the gates of heaven for all of us. That is the future waiting for us. How to live in the future? Bring that future here now. Live with Jesus now. Let us not wait to live with Jesus after death. Live with Jesus now. Bring the future to the present. Okay? And also, living in the future means being open. We cannot predict everything that will happen tomorrow. But be open in trust and confidence to the Lord who runs our lives, in whose hands we find ourselves. You know, looking at you, I cannot help but imagine myself when I was a teenager like you. When I was your age, I did not know that one day I would become a priest, that I would become a bishop, that I would become a cardinal, and that I would be a speaker in uh, the World Youth Day, you know. But uh, how do you live in the future? Make full use of the opportunities of the present. Develop your capacities. Develop your mind. Continue learning. Continue loving. And continue being open to God's inspiration. And that's how you prepare yourselves also for a future that you do not fully know and will not fully understand. So live the future now. And finally, starting again. Some concrete steps. You know, in family life, starting over and over again happens with communication. Very often, we presume, we presume things. You look at the face of someone and you already decide, ah, he is upset. Why don't you ask? You already decided that the person is angry. Ask first, are you angry? Maybe the person will say, no, I am hungry. <laughs> you see? But because you do not ask the question, and in your mind say, oh, he is angry, so I avoid him. Why are you avoiding a hungry person? Huh? <laughs> so communication. And when you notice that you have hurt someone, be humble, ask pardon. Huh? Do not let a day pass without asking pardon and saying, I'm sorry. No. The other thing, what Jesus did, self-emptying. When we are full of self, we become an agent of destruction. Jesus became the agent of salvation by kenosis, emptying himself in order to embrace the situation of the other person. For us, it is understanding. Empty yourself. Put yourself in the situation of the other person so that you can understand with compassion what the other person is going through. But, you know, these are basic. Communication, ask questions. Be sorry when you have offended. Empty yourselves so that you can understand uh, the others and be compassionate to the other person. Then, with that, you start over and over again. Thank you. Thank you.
We're going to stop there. Thank you for everything that you've shared with us. Thank you for this encouragement to say to us that marriage is a gift, but at the same time a responsibility to start a family. We're going to have Mass at 12.15 here together. We can take time now um, to have a break and then have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much.